um, not uh, completely independent uh, uh, Michelson interferometers, which are put uh, on, a, on an orbit uh, around the sun, uh, following the, the Earth. Uh, the other uh, sort of more indirect ways uh, we have to measure gravitational waves are pulsar timing array, okay, that are sensitive to much lower frequencies than uh, around the, the nanohertz, and therefore their target are uh, 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 black hole binaries of masses much larger than uh, those that can be detected by uh, uh, Earth rays, interferometers, and LISA. And also, uh, uh, we have, as you all know, the cosmic microwave background uh, at, uh, at frequencies corresponding to about uh, uh, the horizon at uh, matter radiation equality. Okay, there are two uh, main observables uh, in what concerns gravitational waves. There is a gravitational wave strain, which is just the amplitude of the wave, uh, and it is uh, uh, proportional to the variation in the, length, uh, in the length of the interferometer arm that the gravitational wave is, is uh, causing. Okay, and that's uh, the typical quantity that one measures uh, when one has a uh, spiraling of compact binaries. But uh, uh, there is also the possibility to observe uh, a stochastic background of uh, uh, gravitational waves. And this will be due then, uh, this is the, the, the signal from binaries which are too numerous and with too low signal to noise ratio to be identified individually. So all these sources contribute a background. So you see a background here, so wh while before the, 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 observ the, the, the um, observable in time is a very well-defined uh, uh, waveform, in the case of a background, it's just uh, something similar to noise. The other possibility to generate a stochastic gravitational wave background here is uh, uh, signals from the very early universe, as we will see, because these typically have uh, correlation scale, uh, scales which are much smaller than the typical resolution of a detector. So uh, whatever comes from the early universe appears as a stochastic background. In this case, the observable is the gra uh, gravitational wave energy density power spectrum. Okay, now to focus more on the, on, the, on the issue of gravitational waves and cosmology. Basically, there are two main um, topics uh, uh, that uh, for, for which gravitational waves can uh, probe or constrain cosmology. The first one is constraints on the, on the late time universe, so constraints on the uh, accelerated expansion, uh, so test of acceleration of the universe. And, and the second one, uh, so this is typically done as we will see with the, uh, with the gravitational wave emitted by uh, compact binaries. On the other end, uh, the other possibility, gravitational waves can be used to test the very early universe, inflation and beyond, and this here, the observable, is typically a stochastic gravitational wave background. Okay, to start with the first topic, the, uh, then this is uh, what is called standard sirens, and it is the fact that gravitational wave emission by compact binaries can be used just much as supernovae to test the expansion of the universe. Now, the point is the following. If you look at uh, the waveform which is uh, emitted, uh, if your binary is at a cosmological distance, uh, the factor one over r, which is common to every uh, wave, a spherical wave, here becomes uh, one over the cosmological, uh, one over the luminosity distance. Okay, so, so gravitational waves uh, measurement provide a very clean measurement of the luminosity distance of the binary which is emitting gravitational waves. Now, out of the uh, luminosity distance, in principle, you can get out the cosmological parameters if you know the redshift. So from the gravitational wave observation, you, you don't measure the redshift, and therefore, you need an independent measurement of the redshift coincident with the measurement of the gravitational wave emission in order to build the, 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 the uh, luminosity distance versus redshift diagram. Okay? And in this case, you can access cosmological parameters using standard silence. Now, this is possible and it has already happened, uh, as you know, so with, the, with this coincident uh, detection of uh, a neutron star uh, binary merger and a kilonova, the error bars now are huge compared to what you are used to seeing in cosmology, but this is going to improve. Um, in particular, let me focus on LISA uh, because uh, uh, 
I'm not sure, uh, so I, I didn't have time to prepare for the Earth-based interferometers. But these are, so these are the forecast, uh, and you see the forecast are not very nice concerning the, the, the possibility of LISA to probe uh, omega matter and the, Hubble, and the Hubble scale. Now, if you say that uh, still, uh, I mean, that you can combine with the CMB measurements for omega matter to get uh, 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 an independent sort of independent measurement on, on the Hubble scale, then you can do something quite interesting, but still. So in the context of lambda CDM, LISA uh, will not help much with respect to what is, uh, uh, is going to be future uh, cosmological surveys. Uh, on the other hand, um, there are many, uh, many um, possible sources uh, that can be used, the LISA sources that can be used to constrain uh, the luminosity distance. Uh, versus redshift relation. And these numbers are uh, performed, are, are calculated using only massive black hole binaries. These are binaries of the order of 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 solar masses, okay? And they are typically at very high, quite high redshift, you see, in any case larger than 1. So it is not surprising that these kind of sources don't give a, a very good uh, measurement, especially uh, if you put some dark energy in it. Uh, on the other hand, there are other kind of sources that can be used and the analysis are ongoing at lower redshift. So LISA will also be able to, uh, to measure some of the uh, same kind of black hole binaries that are visible uh, by Earth-based interferometers or stellar mass black hole binaries. And also extreme mass ratio in spirals, so uh, meaning a very compact object like a black hole, which is in spiraling around a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy. You see, and what is uh, uh, interesting about these uh, sources is that they are at lower redshift, so they are better candidates to probe uh, dark energy. And also, they are not expected, contrary to massive black hole binaries, these objects are not expected to have electromagnetic counterparts. However, one can use uh, uh, statistical methods to identify the redshift. And in this case, one would have uh, a measurement which is fairly independent from the electromagnetic emission. So it would be a test of the universe using really gravitational waves. Uh, where LISA can be much more promising uh, with respect to uh, testing the late time ac acceleration is in test of modified gravity theories. Uh, that lead, uh, those theories that lead to some kind of friction term uh, in the gravitational wave propagation equation. Here uh, you see there is no modification of the, of the speed uh, of gravitational waves because of the constraints that have been put uh, by the coincident detection of uh, the neutron star binary emission in gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves. So the, in these kind of theories, uh, the, the, the luminosity distance in gravitational waves is uh, different than the one uh, by the electromagnetic emission. And uh, 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 there has been a, a recent work uh, done within the cosmology working group of LISA, uh, which uh, forecasted the, the LISA sensitivity to uh, a parameter that can be used to parameterize this difference in the luminosity distances. And you see that, of course, uh, uh, Electromagnetic-based uh, surveys are not uh, sensitive to it, but if you add LISA, you have a uh, good, uh, good possibility of constraining this parameter, which is uh, uh, actually a fairly general um, parameterization of this kind of modified gravity theories. So I would say that this is the most promising way, um, way in which uh, uh, LISA can test late time uh, uh, acceleration and then therefore constrain modified gravity theories. Now, uh, let me go to the other part, uh, which is signals from the early universe. Okay, so here the, the situation, uh, so the main, the main concept uh, is the following, is the fact that you see, um, so he, here you have time uh, going by and the energy decreasing. So what do we know about the universe is uh, up to the MeV scale uh, through CMB and b nucleosynthesis, And then we know about inflation with CMB anisotropies, right? But here there are a, a, a range of scales in which we are, ex I mean, we, we think that interesting phenomena have been going on, right? Like reheating, biogenesis, phase transition, dark matter candidates, etc. And these scales are obviously not accessible with, uh, with photons because photons are tightly coupled. 
but uh, gravitational waves are not. So in principle, if we have uh, gravitational waves uh, um, production uh, uh, at, at these scales, uh, this can give us uh, uh, direct information on the status of the universe. Uh, this case that we cannot otherwise probe uh, with, uh, with electromagnetic waves. Uh, the, 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 the reason is because gravity is weak, so uh, the gravitational wave signal for the early universe can be used as a probe of high energy physics because gravitational waves propagate freely uh, through the universe contrary to photons. I would say that there is a big potential here. It is just a potential for now, okay? But uh, there is a big potential because it's, this is something similar to what was the CMB at its dawn, right? We have we measured now the CMB because photons de have decoupled at some point. So there is potential. Now, the, the problem is do we expect sources and do, uh, gravitational wave sources and do we, we expect gravitational wave sources with enough amplitude to be detectable? Okay, um, so first of all, a few definitions. What are, what are gravitational waves in the early universe? Well, the, the, you insert here a tensor uh, perturbation in the, in, the, in the Friedman metric. And as you know, uh, you can generate this tensor perturbation uh, during inflation. Uh, so without any source here by the amplification of vacuum fluctuation due to the expansion of the background. But you can also think that you can put an active source at the right hand side of this equation if uh, uh, there is some process in the early universe which produces some tensor and isotropic stress, okay? And this is not easy because it, it is uh, some sort of anisotropy, so you know that this is constrained to be small, uh, but in, for in principle what, we could what one could have is a, a chaotic distribution of, uh, of velocity in the early universe fluid, it can have a tensor component an electromagnetic field at large scales, or even the presence of a scalar field, which is not uh, uh, homogeneous and isotropic, but which has uh, uh, spatial gradients that can arrange themselves in order to provide a tensor component. So if one, has, uh, uh, if, if one comes out with some mechanism in the early universe that provides one of these sources, then uh, you can have a source of gravitational waves, uh, of a stochastic background of gravitational waves. Now, clearly, this is all uh, physics, which is beyond the standard model, because I'm talking about energy scales, which are higher than the MEV, uh, between inflation and the MEV. So people have speculated a lot. So there are certainly many, many candidates, uh, the candidate theories, to produce uh, a stochastic background of gravitational waves. Now, the, the problem is uh, all these are based on, on, on standard physics, so uh, it is difficult to say this is more motivating than the other. But many of them are related with inflation and, uh, uh, okay, we have the reducible background from inflation, but they, there are possibilities to enhance this background with uh, different ways. There are also alternatives, alternatives to inflation and uh, preheating. And then there are other uh, generation mechanisms in the early universe not connected uh, with inflation, but connected with some uh, uh, high energy phase transition, like uh, the presence of a first order phase transition or a phase transition leading to topological defects. So I will give you a few examples of, uh, uh, of sources and the signal they can produce. But first of all, let me tell you uh, a bit more general what we expect. Uh, from the early universe, so obviously uh, these that I'm talking about, uh, besides inflation, these are all uh, sources that operate sub-horizon uh, during, uh, during a phase of, uh, of, uh, of uh, radiation domination in the universe, so we expect the gravitational waves to have a correlation scale which is at best the horizon at the temperature, at the energy scale at which the source is operating. And therefore, today, we have access to many uncorrelated uh, regions, and this is why the signal is a stochastic background. But this tells us something about the characteristic frequency that we expect for these gravitational waves. It must be related to the, 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 um, the causality scale or the, the Hubble factor in this scale uh, uh, at, at the temperature at which the source is operating. 
uh, with uh, obviously then uh, some, some uh, parameter here that depends uh, really on the source, which depends then on the characteristic scale of the tensor stresses that I, I showed you before are the, the, the process generating the gravitational waves. But this equation, we know how to propagate it up to today, right? So the, 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 the gravitational wave frequency today can be put in relation with the energy scale at which uh, we can expect maybe a gravitational wave source. And therefore, one can construct this kind of plots in which here you have energy scales in the universe. Here you have the typical frequency of the gravitational wave you expect. And you see, if you look at the CMB or, or large scale structure, BBN, of course, uh, you, you probe whatever from the, uh, from the MEV uh, down. But, but uh, uh, gravitational wave detectors, because they operate at high frequency, they are actually sensitive to um, energy scales in the early universe, which uh, uh, can be uh, much higher. Okay, this is the current uh, situation of bounds and uh, observatories. Uh, this is the energy density um, in gravitational waves as a function of frequency. And here you see the sensitivity of uh, current and future uh, gravitational wave detectors. And uh, let me go now in the last five minutes to examples of signals. So let me start with uh, something you, know, you all know very well, which is uh, uh, slow roll inflation, right? In, in, in this case, in the, in, the, in the standard scenario, you expect uh, um, uh, the amplitude of gravitational waves as a function of frequency to uh, be uh, slightly red tilted. So, in, so with the current bounds given by Planck, uh, the, the amplitude which is expected is, 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 very, is very low. Is, is it, it is too low to be detect directly detected by any uh, proposed uh, gravitational wave uh, uh, interferometer. On the other hand, you can think about scenarios that enhance this, uh, this slope because uh, uh, the, the observational end all we have on this is only on very large scales, right? Uh, here I give you just one example in which you introduce this kind of coupling in the Lagrangian between a pseudo-scalar inflaton and, and, and a gauge field, and this kind of things enhances the, the gravitational wave uh, spectrum, for example, in the Lisa band. But you can do an exercise which is more or less related uh, to a mechanism, and uh, you can... You can probe uh, the, 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 the how uh, Lisa, for example, will be able to constrain uh, the parameter space in the tensor to scalar ratio and the tensor spectral index. Of course, going beyond the uh, slow roll scenarios. Another, another example of source, as I told you, are first order phase transitions, right? In this case, you have the generation of, of bubbles of the true vacuum in the false vacuum C. For example, if uh, beyond the standard paradigm, if the QCD or the electric phase transition are first order, which they are not in the context of the standard model, but you can also have, for example, a higher temperature phase transitions. And when this bubble expand and collide, uh, the collision leads is a, is a powerful source of tensor stresses because if you think about it, you have all the three sources here that are excited uh, during a first order phase transition. And what is interesting, if you consider uh, this kind of relation, as I told you before, so Lisa is the millihertz here, meaning that uh, uh, this, uh, the energy scale that Lisa can probe is around the TeV scale. So uh, it can probe just beyond the LHC. So you can, you, you can use Lisa to test stuff, uh, the occurrence of a first order electric symmetry breaking leading to baryon asymmetry, uh, possibly dark matter candidates, etc. Pulsar timing arrays that det det detect at nanohertz, they are actually sensitive to the uh, 100 MeV scale where you expect the QCD phase transition, while hertz-based detectors uh, with their best sensitivity at 100 hertz, they, uh, are, uh, they are sensitive to uh, phase transition occurring around 10 to the 5 GeV. So this is really speculative. We have no, no theoretical handle or, or of what can go on at this, uh, at this energy scale. And this is one example of signal in a, in a BSM scenario that has, was proposed before, uh, um, I mean, independently on the gravitational wave production. So again, uh, the energy density as a function of frequency. The red curve is the LISA, uh, the LISA sensitivity, and this is uh, the, the typical spectrum of gravitational wave that one 
expects. Okay, and to conclude, uh, just I want to mention other kind of source which are cosmic strings. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the um, gravitational wave uh, background really depends on, uh, on the model uh, that, you, that you choose, okay? So, so uh, prediction can be done only uh, within given models, but if you take the most favorable model, which is the Nambugoto local strings, uh, with some uh, choices for the loop size and loop distribution, then LISA can probe uh, G mu down to 10 to the minus 17, which is uh, better, uh, fairly better than what future uh, probes can, uh, can do. Okay, this is an example of the spectrum uh, from, uh, from Nambugoto strings, and you see the spectra are uh, very... Um, very um, extended in frequency uh, because it is a continuous production from the phase transition from when the, the string network is generated up to uh, today. Okay, so well, to, to conclude, so I, uh, we know that LIGO Virgo detection have opened the era of GV astronomy and cosmology. Uh, we already have interesting results on cosmology with gravitational waves, quite unexpected actually. Uh, Lisa is on the path to launch in 2034, and uh, I hope I showed you, I convinced you that it has the potential to probe the early universe and late time cosmology. In particular, it, it can probe uh, the, the late time acceleration uh, um, of the universe and uh, also a cosmic uh, relic uh, gravitational wave background. Uh, and in the particular case of Lisa, uh, it, it provides an handle on the electroic scale uh, in the early universe. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. You talked about this guaranteed gravitational wave background from uh, in spiraling binaries. Will Lisa see that? And if yes, would that be, uh, could it still see something, for example, from the electroweak phase transition, or would it be difficult to disentangle these signals or not? Yeah, so this is an analysis that still needs to be done uh, in details. But, uh, uh, if you think, okay, so if you uh, consider uh, the background that is generated at the at, um, interferometer uh, frequencies, okay, uh, sorry, at the Earth-based interferometer frequencies, and you extend this background down to the frequencies of LISA, then it is very well visible. It is something, you know, within, within the uncertainty on the, on the binary uh, rates, uh, but it is still something that crosses this curve like this. It has a, a shape which is f to the two thirds, okay? So it is a blue shape and it has a fairly high amplitude. So this kind of signal would still be, be visible in the peak, but certainly not this, this tail here, for example. And it could hide signals from the early universe. However, this calculation, you know, uh, has been done with respect to uh, the sensitivity of Earth-based interferometers. But, uh, you know, a background, by definition, needs to be calculated accounting for the sensitivity of the instrument you are considering because it is the signal for, from all superposed uh, binaries that that instrument cannot measure. So I think, it, and this is still to do, it's something that we still need to do within the LISA cosmology working group to really calculate what would be, would be the level with respect to LISA sensitivity. Yeah, so the, there is, a, there is a w one proposal, uh, but the calculations are still done, in, you know, as far as they can go perturbatively, so it is not clear. But the, the, the idea is that this lattice uh, simulation have been done in the assumption that the, the, the lepton asymmetry is zero. 
But in the early universe, we don't know what the lepton asymmetry would be because it could be hidden in the neutrino sector or it could be high. Like 10 to the minus two, I think, are the, the constraints up to now. And so these people, is, uh, Dominic Schwartz and a student of his, they have demonstrated, no, not demonstrated, they, they have hinted at the fact that the presence of a large lepton asymmetry could change the order of the QCD phase transition. So it, it is quite an, uh, an old result, uh, five or six years ago, and uh, there has been no, um, you know, more precise uh, prediction, but the result is there. Pulsar timing arrays, yes. More questions? Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker again and all the speakers of the afternoon. <laughs> and now we have concluding remarks from Georgia Stathew. Paris Summer University. <coughs> Okay, everybody. Um, so uh, it's nearly the end. So thanks to the organizers um, and to all of the speakers for the, for the wonderful talks. Um, I also think that the, the organizers have been very brave in asking me to summarize <laughs> this meeting. Okay. Um, so I... Um, <coughs> I'll first tell you about my attitude towards data and inference, okay? So, you know, we have some new theory, hypothesis H given some data, and I want to do a comparison against lambda CDM. I would do something like that, okay? Now, if tomorrow on Astro PH, Somebody put an analysis down, you know, submitted an analysis that was, you know, four sigma away from Planck or lambda CDM, I would disbelieve it, okay? And that's because there's some additional stuff here, some of P systematics, and my prior that that result was due to systematics in the data would overwhelm any uh, evidence for new physics. And in fact, if somebody put something that was seven sigma away from lambda CDM, I would disbelieve it even more. <laughs> so you can never convince me that there's any new physics beyond <laughs> lambda CDM, okay? And I mean, some of you um, have experienced uh, my, uh, my skepticism and distrust um, at first hand, okay? Now, that's because I had a very unhappy childhood, okay? <laughs> now, the alternative, which is just to ignore this and take the data at face value, is equally bad. If somebody goes and puts something in the literature and it's seven sigma away from what we know and you don't question it, 
then you'll be biased. Okay? So you have to have a degree of criticality. And clearly, the, uh, um, you know, the, the sensible thing is to be somewhere between you know, just accepting everything at face value and rejecting everything like I do. Okay? Uh, okay, so the um, so first important point is statistics and inference is subjective. Probability is subjective. Okay, and you know that that uh, you have to understand that I think um, to understand how people will react to analyses, particularly if they're complicated analyses. So let me start with um, with the stuff that I know, which is which is Planck. So here is uh, power spectrum, uh, as in the 2018 analysis. And, um, you know, it's an exceptional fit to a six-parameter lambda CDM model. Now, in, uh, in doing this experiment, I mean, you can go back to the ESA Red Book and all of the exotic physics that we thought we might uh, discover with Planck, and we found none of it. Very, very frustrating. I was very frustrated. Francois, massively frustrated. We tried very hard to find new physics in this data. You know, just give us a little bit of non-Gaussianity, just something, you know, a, a string, just, just anything, okay? But not bloody lambda CDM, okay? And that's what it, you know, so we tried very hard, and we found nothing. So, you know, you, you do something like that, um, and uh, it looks like lambda CDM, okay? So people then get excited, uh, as Wayne did, with, you know, um, are there any little residual oscillations, little things, you know, uh, you know sort of evidence of uh, the A lens is a little bit anomalous and so on. So since the 2018 papers, I've looked at that uh, by pushing the data much harder, primarily by using more sky. Now, you don't have to do any statistical analysis to see, uh, to see what happens, because you can see visually. Just look at this spectrum and look at this more powerful spectrum. And it's not a lot more powerful, but it's more powerful. And you can see that uh, the spectrum quietens down. It gets closer to lambda CDM with the same parameters, OK? Uh, you know, and, and this is also true in the polarization spectrum. You push the data a bit. It's closer to lambda CDM. There is no room in this data for any other physics other than lambda CDM. So, uh, so have we uncovered a fundamental truth about the universe, uh, that it's lambda CDM? Well, um, what we've done is actually measure very accurately uh, stuff that we don't understand. So that's our great achievement in cosmology. Um, so, uh, so um, the, you know, the theory has ingredients that we simply don't understand. We don't understand the dark matter. We don't understand the dark energy. We don't understand inflation. So in a phenomenological sense, uh, it fits the data. But in the sense of what do we understand, the answer is not a lot. And so I think that's a very, you know, very serious situation, OK? Um, so let's look at one of the, the most important results, um, which is uh, the constraints on the tensor scalar ratio and uh, the scalar spectral index. So these are uh, a, a joint results with Planck uh, constraining the uh, spectral index and bicep keck and so on primarily constraining the tensor to scalar ratio. Well, this plot is uh, familiar to, to you all um, and, um, and it's very interesting because it's, it's forcing us to flat inflationary potentials. Okay, so if we look um, in slow roll parameters, then we have, uh, sorry, let me get the, the pointer. We have a, 
uh, an accurate measurement of Ns, here are our two slow roll parameters, epsilon and eta, R uh, is dependent on epsilon, and we see that what we found is the emergence of a, of a new hierarchy. Okay, so, th so um, epsilon is smaller than, than eta. The tighter the limits on, um, on R, uh, the more extreme uh, this hierarchy is, and hierarchies need an explanation. Okay, so, so you know, if we had had a, a power law potential lambda phi to the alpha with alpha of around two, we would have expected to have seen tensor modes by now. Okay, so that is, uh, that is interesting, okay? So we've got a new hierarchy to explain in the context of inflationary models. Now, some people have taken it quite differently, okay? Um, so uh, I'll tell you what happened after the Planck 2015 papers appeared on AstroPH. The, the morning that they appeared, I got an email from Paul Steinhardt saying, how can you say in the Planck papers that the data is in agreement with inflation? It goes counter to inflation, okay? Uh, a little while later, I got an email from uh, Slava Mukhanov saying, why have you not made as much, you know, you haven't made enough about the agreement of, uh, of the Planck data with inflation? So, uh, so I figured that we'd got the balance about right. Um, so here is an article, very provocative article, uh, by Anna, Paul Steinhardt, and Avi Loeb. I was hoping that Anna would, uh, would talk about this. Um, so they're saying new data, new data from Planck, uh, is, uh, uh, makes inflation seem very, very unlikely. And um, that uh, upset uh, a lot of inflationary theorists and then uh, I was asked to contribute to a rebuttal letter to Scientific American as a, as a Planck person. Um, so, um, so this thing appeared, making the case that inflation was, was, was a good theory. Um, and uh, then Avi and Paul wrote another article to Scientific American, and at that point, the editor said, we don't want any more articles about this. You know, so that was the end of that. What is the argument? Well, I actually take their arguments very seriously. You know, we have uh, inflation with, you know, flat potentials. Inflation is eternal. So you have a multiverse. We don't have, a, we can't, we have no idea of what measure to put on this multiverse. And so we can't predict anything. And so their argument was more or less a philosophical argument that if you can't predict anything, it's not a theory, okay? What we argued here, and what I actually think is you know, a reasonable way of arguing, is that inflation is an incomplete theory. It's incomplete, so there's stuff about inflation that we don't understand. And maybe one day we'll, we'll uh, uh, figure out the measure problem. So, so I mean, you know, people, a couple of people put, well, I shouldn't draw it like that, put potentials like this, okay, with a flat region. So you can get something that fits with the data if the inflaton rolls down a flat part of the potential. But if I draw something like this, if I start inflating here, I'm rewarded by exponential factors, exponential e-foldings compared to here. Many, many more e-foldings. So it's not clear why you should start in a flat region. And we don't know how to calculate any of that stuff. And that's serious. That's serious problem for theory. So now imagine that um, we make fantastic progress. We find some degree of non-Gaussianity or something. So we've learned something now that it's, inflation is not a simple free field or whatever. Um, does it help us with that problem? No. If we discover tensor modes, does it help us with that problem? Well, we have, might have more confidence in inflation, right? But it doesn't help us with that problem. This is a serious problem. 
And as far as I can see, the only way of dealing with this problem is to theorize our way out of it. There's no experiment that I can think of that would have any bearing at all on this problem, but it's a major problem. And so it's not inconceivable, I think, that the entire edifice could be wrong. Okay, that is Robert was arguing. So I think it's important to have, you know, at least have an awareness that we're uh, on very thin ice with inflation and uh, that there may be, uh, you know, eventually more attractive theories. So let's go to, to, uh, to dark energy. I hate this way of parameterizing dark energy as WWA because it hides so much physics. Okay, so, you know, this stuff, as you know, is phantom. Uh, this stuff was phantom in the past. And if, uh, as George Ellis uh, said that he didn't like phantom dark energy, uh, the, the little bit of, uh, yeah, okay, the little bit of, uh, you know, dynamical dark energy that makes, you know, simple theoretical sense is this tiny little region here which is called in the Euclid uh, Amandola et al. article, it's called standard dark energy. So the, you know, dark energy, uh, there's a standard type of dark energy. Okay, so, so this little corner here is actually what the data allows. And what you get from that is that, um, that W, if it's some type of quintessence field, um, you know, uh, you know, W is very close to minus one. Okay. So, uh, so we have three problems. Okay, uh, the cosmological constant problem uh, that you know uh, that we don't understand. The classical cosmological constant problem. If the field is dynamical, then it's got a characteristic mass of ten to the minus thirty-three electron volts. It's a very light field. And this equation is very interesting because this tells you the first derivative in Planck units. And the tighter the constraints become, tighter they are to W equals minus 1, the smaller this uh, slow roll parameter, now quintessent slow roll parameter, is. And we see the emergence of the same type of hierarchy. We want flat potentials. We have no explanation for that. So there's a hierarchy uh, with inflation, and there's the emergence of a hierarchy with dark energy. OK. But in lambda CDM, so now I'm going to tell you why I think lambda CDM is wrong. OK. Um, so. It's infinite de Sitter space. So eventually we will be surrounded by a cavity with an entropy of uh, 10 to the 120. And in this cavity, things like that will happen. Okay, in the infinite future. If it was a bit too quick, there it is. Okay. So, so you'll have a Boltzmann brain problem. And uh, so, you know, I take this seriously. How, how do we avoid bolts and brains? Okay, well, the answer is that it can't be lambda CDM. It can't be de Sitter space in the infinite future. Something has to happen. And there's a time scale that we can uh, attach to this. Okay, so something has to happen on a time scale that's e to the 10 to the 120 times the Planck time. So there you are. Uh, theoretical prediction. Um, OK, so uh, if we look at some another theoretical uh, quantity that we'd, we'd like to ha handle. Whoops. I've uh, lost it. There we go. Um, is, uh, is the value of r. So this is from a recent uh, summary paper by Andre Linder and Renata Kalash, and it, it, it tells you basically uh, the same uh, story that Raphael uh, 
said, here are the constraints on S. There are two classes of models here. There are alpha attractors that go down here. This is the Starobinsky model. This is close to a monomial type model. Um, so, um, so it's, you know, giving you, you know, some indication of a region of uh, a minimum value of R of about 10 to the minus 3. Um, but if we allow ourselves yet another hierarchy, then we can have models like these ones. The, these bands here, sorry, uh, these pink ones and uh, orange bands, they're spanning uh, 50 to 60 E folds of inflation in uh, KKLT type models. So these are brain inflation models um, in warp geometries. And there you can get any value of R that you want. So, so theory doesn't actually give us any real guide. Uh, it would be interesting to get down to this sort of 10 to the minus 3 limit, uh, but it would be perfectly possible to uh, make inflationary models phenomenologically that go down to you know, completely unobservable uh, values. Okay, so we don't ha get a great guide from theory. Another idea that came up uh, was uh, this uh, swampland idea, and the swampland conjecture. They want, um, that's the wrong way, they want uh, derivatives of the potential, first derivative of the potential to be greater than unity, that's the wrong way around. Okay? That's exactly what we don't want observationally. So that doesn't look terribly promising. It's been quite amusing actually seeing people writing papers on uh, the Swampland con conjecture to see where the C of order unity is about 0.3. You know, does that fit the data? Um, so it's not, un you know, it, that's not what the data is telling us. Okay, so we have these fundamental problems uh, with early universe physics. Now, what about tensions? Um, so uh, the biggest tension at the moment, everybody, I think, is in agreement with this. The most significant tension with the Lambda CDM model is with the Hubble constant, the direct measurement of the Hubble constant. So it's 4.4 uh, sigma away. Now, um, I've had, I'm, a, you know, uh, a great admirer of Ad Adam Rees. You know, I have a lot of respect for him. And I've had lots of email correspondence with him, but I'll show you one email, okay? Uh, so you see, I work on Saturdays, and I sent him this email, and what I did here, look, am I the only one that worries that they, in their analysis, they find a period luminosity relation that's shallow, and it's inconsistent with what we see, you know, from, Good, good, because, you know, people don't talk about it, but you're using this as a, as a, you know, precise distance indicator, and the period luminosity relation is too shallow. It's always too shallow in, in Adam's analysis. Hmm? No, 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 but, but their analysis, their stuff disagrees with local analyses where we know it, the period luminosity relation to exquisite precision, okay? So, uh, so... You know, that's, that's a problem. But here, all I did was, was um, look at the photometry as it was in 2011 compared to the photometry that was published in 2016, object by object. And here, I couldn't match everything because we don't have all of the data. So I matched all of the objects that I could. Um, and here are the offsets. You'll see that they're typically more than 0.1 magnitude away. Okay, 0.1 magnitude is enough to kill the, you know, to, to resolve the discrepancy, a 0.1 magnitude offset. In one case, there's a 0.3, over 0.3 magnitudes offset. So I'm skeptical about the Cepheid photometry. Now, for reasons of data protection, I can't show you, without Adam's permission, his reply, but I can tell you roughly what it was, which, um, which was, we understand the photometry a lot better now. And my reply, which was, but you'd have said that in 2011. 
you know? I'm skeptical about the Cepheid photometry, and that's why I think it's really important that people like Sherry and Wendy are doing other things, okay? We need a check on, on this. Okay, now, one thing that, um, <coughs> that really um, annoys me, okay, is this, whenever I see this, okay? And this is, this is because, you know, you know, I'm, I've never been trained as a statistician. I don't know statistical terminology. But I look in the dictionary. I look in the dictionary, and for precision, it says accuracy. And I look in uh, under accuracy, and it says precision. And so I, I, I don't know which one you're supposed to refer to. <coughs> okay, so, so I have a new bit of statistical terminology, okay? which is this, okay? I am not interested in this. This is of no interest, okay? It's only this that's of interest. If you get anything other than this, it's a cock-up, okay? You're doing it wrong. So, uh, <coughs> so anyway, so that's my gripe uh, about this. The other thing that I find disturbing based on uh, the Planck experience um, is the idea of, uh, of uh, using fancy techniques, okay? Um, you know, and, you know, ha having lots of nuisance parameters. I think the idea that <clears throat> we, we will have, um, you know, that there'll be convincing evidence for new physics from very complex analyses with, with black boxes and lots of nuisance parameters, I think that's going to be very difficult to sell to, to the community. Okay? What I think you need to do <clears throat> is to calibrate everything as, w where you can. Work aggressively to calibrate things. Okay? And so that you, you know what, what nuisance parameters are actually doing. And you have to have summary statistics so that if there's new physics, we can see that it, there's a bump there or something in your summary statistics and that it doesn't move with respect to, to well-calibrated nuisance parameters. So there's no plausible room anywhere uh, you know, uh, for explaining the result other than new physics. So that's what I think we, we need to do. Okay, so... Um, so reasons to be cheerful. Um, it is absolutely amazing how many projects there are and, and how ambitious these projects are. Oh, I forgot the Hubble constant. I'll go, go back. I'll go back to the Hubble constant. You've each, I hope, got a value of the Hubble constant. OK. All right. Who has a value that's less than 71? Ben is the only one. Okay, these are all drawn from a Gaussian distribution with the Reese value and error, okay? There's only one, okay, uh, which is Ben. All right. <coughs> now, there have been papers on AstroPH, two in the last week, claiming to resolve the tension with Hubble con uh, you know, between Planck and the Reese value. And you look in the paper, and they managed to get the Hubble constant up to 69. That's not resolving the tension, okay? Um, it's putting, still putting the, most of the pain, it's, it, th that's a class of solution that's trying to share the pain uh, between Planck and, uh, and Adam, with Adam bearing most of the p pain, okay? So I think we need to do something to, uh, you know, to, to just, you know, calm the field down a bit. So, so what I've done, I've arranged with the moderators of AstroPH, okay? You can only use H0 tension in the title or abstract of a paper you know, if you send them one of these chits, okay? And your model has to have a central value of the Hubble constant that's bigger than the value on your chit, okay? So that means that, you know, you have to have a, a theory that's at least predicting 71 for one chip to be used, okay? Now, I don't care, you can have an internal market of chips, okay? 
uh, exchange them, you know, put a value on them if you want, okay? But the goal uh, is try and find models, okay, that resolve the tension, okay? Put some effort into models that will resolve the tension. Okay, so, um, so I forgot, forgot about that. Um, I don't know why it's gone back to the beginning. I'm nearly at the end. Right, um, reasons to be cheerful, there's all this stuff, okay? So first, a bit of advice for theorists, okay? Um, <coughs> we have had one great theoretical idea, which is inflation. That was 40 years ago. You're not working hard enough, okay? We need more good ideas. We need another good idea. We need you to tackle, uh, you know, these fundamental problems of the origin of inflation, where it comes from, you know, measures, and so on. So that's a tough challenge. For the observers, my advice is ignore anything that theorists tell you. <laughs> Don't believe anything, okay? The universe is wide open. It's cleverer than us. Lambda CDM, as I've demonstrated, proved to you today, is the wrong theory. Okay, so use the opportunity of these wonderful instruments, okay, so seek and you will find, okay, so you have to have some confidence that nature uh, will be kinder to you than it was to us on Planck, so thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, so that's been a pleasure to have you all here, uh, and we'll be continuing the fiesta in a short while in a, on a different mode. Um, the only thing about, I wanted to say about the goal of this meeting was uh, inspired by the various uh, sampling problem that we have been hearing a lot of in this week, but what we tried was to do a little bit different type of sampling sampling different type of people. First of all, you may have noticed that there were theorists, observers, uh, data analysts, applied mathematicians, and you name it, plus a few others that I don't even know what they were doing. Um, so we had a great sample of young blood and older blood, uh, aspiring stars and confirmed ones. Uh, we had also, we, in the subject we approached, we tried to cover quite a bit of ground uh, of all the various great avenues that uh, we are pursuing. As George was just saying uh, seconds ago, we are very blessed about what in the, in the future. Uh, we've also been sampling uh, the temperature scale. Uh, you may have noticed, uh, even though not the very cold part, I, I must admit. Uh, we tried also pretty hard to get you sampled a little bit on the French corners, on the various type of cheese, wine, bread, uh, cold cuts, and so on, which I hope some success. Um, so it's been a great pleasure for it. Oh, yes, I forgot also, I mean, if you, uh, in the topics uh, from uh, pretty standard stuff to things which were a little bit on the, on the well, newer or a little bit more variety maybe than the standard conference. And apparently you stayed, with many of you, till the end. This is, this is pretty impressive. Uh, so that's been a great pleasure for us to assemble this uh, elite crowd. Uh, we enjoyed having you. We're happy that you stayed that long. Uh, and I think that's about all I wanted to say. But uh, of course, all of this was made possible by people that are not front stage uh, and they need to, they deserve some appreciation. Sylvia? Uh, Yes, so again, as Francois said, thank you very much for, for coming. It's been a great uh, 
conference. I must say, uh, I think uh, we, we agree with Francois that when designs a conference for one year, you know, everything you would like to hear and then you spend your, all your time, you know, debugging and like solving for issues and, um, but um, I, I hope that you all enjoy the scientific interactions uh, this week. And as Francois was saying, so we really would like to give the credit to all the uh, people that uh, actually helped us uh, during this uh, year of, of preparation. We had the chance to have in the lock brilliant scientists that actually um, gave uh, their brains to very you know, mundane, mundane and very technical things. So I would like to thank Eric, uh, who, as you saw, the whole week uh, helped us with audio video. He designed the beautiful graphics that, and logos and, and the goodies that you have. So thank you very much, Eric, for all your work. Um, so, Shuvadeep, who took care of the posters and the management. Thank you very much. Uh, we had students that clearly helped us this week with the mics, as you saw, Pierre, Alexandra, Hao, and uh, Dugesh. Thank you, guys. And, and I would like to thank the, also the technical staff here at uh, IAP. Um, so first of all, uh, Jean for taking care again of audio video and the broadcast on YouTube, which apparently was a great success. Um, yes. <laughs> um, Lionel, who I uh, unfortunately I don't see in the in the room, oh, but uh, took care of the website. Um, but he's not responsible for the Azure stuff and the ridiculous stuff that CNRS imposed <laughs> on us for, for all, that is not his doing. Yeah, that's <laughs> unfortunately is, is out of our control. So um, if you, we didn't, you know, if, if we survived this heat wave in Paris, uh, so thanks to Francois on Friday really took uh, yeah. his, the, 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 the problem in his hands and uh, thanks to Christophe there who, uh, <laughs> Actually, who, who worked very hard during the weekend to, you know, actually <laughs> make this happen. So thank you very much, Christophe, and all for all the arranging of the rooms. <laughs> Double applause. Um, Nitaya, Cynthia, Isabel, all the others, and especially Valerie, uh, who helped us during uh, the, the week. And a very special thank to uh, Sandy, who actually had the responsibility for the organization. Yeah. And uh, thank you all for, for coming to Paris. It's been a great conference. And just a positive note, I think uh, um, we had all wonderful speakers, and I think we also had, in particular, a lot of uh, women, excellent scientists that came to the conference. I think this is a positive note. So, uh, hope to see you all very soon. Thank you very much.